the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> this is a poem by Billy Collins, who is the former poet laureate of uh, the United States. It's called The Dead. The dead are always looking down on us, they say, while we are putting on our shoes or making a sandwich. They're looking down through the glass-bottomed boats of heaven as they row themselves slowly through eternity. They watch the tops of our heads moving below on earth. And when we lie down in a field or on a couch, drugged perhaps by the hum of a warm afternoon, they think we are looking back at them, which makes them lift their oars and fall silent and wait like parents for us to close our eyes. We all struggle and clutch at the veil between this world and the next, trying to grab a hold of images that seem ethereal and yet sticky in their way and somewhat distasteful. It's rather like stumbling through an attic in the dark, clutching at spider webs, trying to find a lost piece of furniture. Death is hard, especially the death of children. Uh, some years ago, uh, after Henry, my son, was born, I had a dream in which he died or at least was critically injured, and the dream was so disturbing that some part of my mind kind of yelled out a safe word, and I woke up from the dream in the middle of the night. And if I choose to, I can remember vividly some of the images of that dream, but of course, I don't choose to. I don't choose to. I don't want to go there in my mind. When I was a hospital chaplain, the call I least wanted to get was to the pediatric wards, because that usually meant that a child was dead or dying. And I have memories of being there with those parents in those rooms. And you're the one that's expected to say something meaningful to help them contextualize the loss. Or maybe if you want to escape down the road of psychology, you want to help them have healthy grieving or something like that. But the reality is, in the face of that kind of grief, there is nothing to say. There is nothing to say. And in your own mind, where your head goes is you think to yourself, the same thing that Mary thought, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. In the hospital where I worked, we even had a special room. We called it Caroline's Room. It was named after a child who had died, and the parents were uh, well off, and they were disappointed that the hospital didn't have a special place for them to grieve with their child. So they gave money to the hospital to create such a room. It was a, a beautiful, a comfortable room. It had uh, wonderful art on the walls, and it was very quiet. It was in an interior room. It had no windows. It was extremely quiet and peaceful, and they could spend as long as they wanted with their deceased child. I did not like to go into that room. I do not want to go there in my mind, but texts like this one require it of us. The Christian faith requires it of us. We have to go into these places and weep with those who weep. As much as we want to rejoice with those who rejoice, we have to weep with those who will weep. And these texts, both from Elijah and Luke, require us to look dead on at death. A friend of mine wrote an essay uh, a couple of months after the death of his father called uh, Deader Than a Doornail. And he said this, It is not some reducible, barely glimpsed, idealized essence of my dad that escaped and flew free from the fires of the crematorium. He's gone. What remains is ash, as dead as a doornail, and the whole of him, the hands I marveled at as a kid when he played Rachmaninoff's B minor prelude, the fact that he looks so much like mine, and which, in the pictures that I have, still teaches me to smile. The courageous heart that managed to squeeze almost 87 years of living from a terrifying beginning as a preemie in 1921 and scarlet fever a few years later. The whole of that good man was and is and will be held in God's love. I don't know what it means or looks like, but I trust it. God's initiative. God's creative embrace that won't let one vibration of one atom that was him out of the old new whole of God's making. The gospel writers are so determined that it is God's initiative that their preferred language for Jesus' resurrection is that the Father raised him up. The darkness, the abandonment, the devastation and decay, and knowledge that we're all just in remission, and each of us alone faces a moment of terror and eternal dark, must sink in, take hold, and be bitterly true. We're none of us going to get out of this alive. None of us and nothing in us any match for death. Nothing except the love of God. Jesus' response to death and to grief when he encounters it in the Gospels is unambiguous. 
he weeps with those who weeps. Uh, in, in the Gospel of Luke, that happens not only in the passage that we have today, but in the passage from, from the resurrection of Lazarus, where he encounters Mary, and it says in the text, Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Why was he weeping? It's been a question for theologians. Didn't he know he was going to resurrect Jesus? Didn't he know that even if he didn't, Jesus would have life in the final resurrection, and the final consummation of things, that he was in a better place? Maybe Jesus would be no more satisfied by that answer. He's in a better place than we are. Maybe Jesus weeps with those who weeps because the weeping is real, because death is real. And the ultimate reality on the other side of that doesn't excuse us from being in that place first. In fact, maybe it's our courage of being in that place of grief which allows us to experience the resurrection in its fullness before we experience it in the time to come. Weeping with those who weep. But beloved, that's not where the story ends. No, no. Jesus touches that beer and he says, young man, I say to you, rise. In another passage, he says to a little girl, little girl, get up. Tabitha Kuhn, get up. I was once in a workshop where we dramatized that lesson of a little girl being raised. And uh, Donald Shell actually, who wrote the essay I just read a glimpse of, he was actually leading this workshop. And he challenged us, uh, the, the people that were acting as the parents in this scene, to really go to that place of grief for their child, as though their child had died. Because, he, of course, the degree to which they could enter that would animate everything else and all the meaning of the rest of the enactment. And it was a powerful moment. It was a powerful moment when the person playing Jesus touched that little girl, who in this case was a six-year-old woman, and, and asked her, Tabitha Kuhn, get up. Was there joy? Sure. But there's also this fear and amazement that they experience. This fear seized all of them. And they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has risen among us. Luke knows very well that lots of children would die in Israel. Luke knows very well that lots of people will die in our experience, too. But that doesn't stop this one story from saying something important about God and about God's love. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. The blessing of the resurrection is something that we snatch at through veils of spiderwebs in the attics of our minds, but it's there. And our human condition requires us to reach for it. We grasp at it, we cut through those shadows and through those webs, looking for that hope. And we find it. Glimpses and small snatches. A corner of a piece of rocking chair that we had forgotten about. The end table that used to be our grandparents' bedside table. Somewhere in that attic, there is that hope, and we experience it through those sharp, hard edges that come out at us from the darkness. Beloved, as people of faith, we are required to go to that place, that dark attic. In doing so, we know that we are in good company with our Lord himself, who went to those dark places at Gethsemane, in the dark tomb. And we know, we speak with confidence that his resurrection is our resurrection too, is the resurrection of all those children who have gone to their reward, is the hope that we hold dear to us when we read passages such as this one. <coughs> Death is hard. And the dead are with us in some way, held in God's love. And we can only respond with amazement, fear, and glory. Amen. <laughs> so I'll open that up if anyone has anything they want to say in response to that.